let's play some hockey. Stars, Blues, Game 3, Series tied at 1. Well, Blues wins. Have been nail-biting finishes. History, Jeff. Okay, your game will be the opening game of the Nat Stadium. Clearly, the Wizards are not the same team that they were in the beginning of this season. They are definitely a force to be reckoned with. You could see the defending champions here tonight playing a back and forth game all night long. And they say that basically he influenced, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali. And he said, listen, would you? A second, but I just, wear, I just wish that was that he All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to The Hustle. Uh, you usually expect to see uh, my, my partner, uh, Elena Seven, that uh, usually does the show, but tonight she could not do the show. She is on, her, on a plane on her way back from a tennis tournament. So, as you know, her, she has twins who are now uh, freshmen in college, and they, they both play uh, are in athletics, and she went down to see them see them uh, tear it up in these tournaments and now she's on her way back and uh, she could not do the show today so you are stuck with me tonight and um so what am i do what i'm gonna do is uh i'm kind of gonna show you the best of um i used to have uh my my own show with elena and another gentleman named marvin jackson on another network you know it was called uh primetime sports and uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a few uh, few videos that I shot while while doing that show. But um, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna congratulate uh, Tiger Woods. Um, as many of you may know, that he won the Masters this past weekend, so that will be his 15th uh, major. And um, I didn't see the tour. I haven't watched golf in in, in a couple of years, but uh, you know, I was I was actually at work, and I noticed that uh, Tiger Woods was doing very well, especially around the second round going into the weekend. Uh, he was one off the lead, and um, really, I didn't I didn't really expect much from him because we hear stories all the time. You know, someone um, gets in good position, and you know, they go into the weekend and it's you know, they just kind of have a mediocre or average day. But uh, I get home uh, Sunday night, and I'm being told that uh, uh, Tiger Woods won the Masters, and I was, you know, I was floored. I was knocked down. So I thought that was a, you know, that was a great thing for him, man. Uh, and the game of golf, which has been kind of stale the last couple couple of years, and he he beat a, a really good field of uh, guys who were playing very well that I. I really don't remember, but uh, cause I, I told you I haven't watched golf in a while. But uh, he won over the uh, uh, back-to-back U.S. Open winner from 2017-2018. Uh, and uh, But he beat, he beat an impressive field. And, um, you know, Tigers, he's had his, his up and downs uh, lately, his, uh, his health issues with his knees and his back. And, uh, you know, some, you know, to be honest, some, uh, some self-inflicted wounds that uh, – he had to had to get over his uh, his divorce and you know a lot of things that's, that's happened since his last major win in 2008 when he won the the, uh, the U.S. Open. Um, but uh, again, I just want to throw it out. Congratulations to Tiger Woods and uh, and uh, hopefully he'll have success in uh, his later years. But um, uh, the first video that. I would like to play is the Wizards Media Day from last from 2018 from the beginning of this season. Because what I'd like to do is at the end of the season, I'd like to go kind of to this beginning and see if we accomplished anything that uh, we said we we're going to accomplish. And uh, it's quite obviously that we didn't. Did the Wizards didn't make the playoffs? Um, they just they kind of stumbled those last last couple. About the last couple months, and uh, you know, we had a lot of injuries and things like that. But um, I'll go ahead and show you this video, and I want you to see if uh, you know you felt we accomplished anything from then till now.
Hey everyone, today the Washington Wizards kick off their 2018-2019 season with their annual media day right here from their brand new facility, training facility in Southeast DC. Now their season just kicks off in a matter of a few weeks, but today we got to hang out with some of the players and hear what they were doing throughout the summer and what their goals and objectives are for this season. I watched tons of film. Um, you know, I did with a couple of my coaches. Um, I worked on my three ball. Uh, I got to keep that consistently, you know, um, make sure it felt right. And defense, I think that was a big thing for me, was learning how to guard on the ball, um, take my angles, uh, you know, able to master that. You know, I studied Kawhi Leonard a lot um, on the angles he took. Um, very, very strategic, you know, about what he, what his movements were, you know. He never seemed tired, so I was able to get in a lot of shape this summer um, because, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot, it's a lot of games. Uh, I wanted to be in the best shape as possible, so. Uh, the game is very different than what it was when I first came in. Uh, so, you know, the defensive schemes that worked uh, when I was younger, it's a little bit different now. Uh, but for me, it's just, you know, trying to go after each shot. You know, it's obviously going to be times where I can't you know, try to block a shot if I got three fouls unless it's really late in the game. Uh, but you just got to be smart, you know. And, you know, we have a very smart team. And I think these guys love playing defense as well. Uh, and they want to play defense. And it starts as an individual to be able to stop a guy with the rim and not just allow him to get to the paint as easy. Um, so uh, just playing against... Uh, uh, this, this team last year, you know, uh, I thought their one-on-one -on -one defense was pretty good. Uh, so uh, you add that in with you know myself and other guys who like to block shots and protect the paint. You know we should be top five in defense this year. You'd rather have team success instead of individual success. What do you think specifically is a goal for this team for this season? Well, man, Ted said the best. No excuses. You know. So there's no excuse for nothing. You know, we want to win the championship. And it's not easy. We're not sitting here saying it's a guarantee. We're not sitting here saying that it's a cakewalk. You know, but we know it's going to be work. But, you know, Ted and Ernie and Coach, they made it happen. We have a team now. I feel like we have the, no, the most depth that we've had since I've been here and maybe even before I've been here. So um, when we got all the pieces aligned, all the stars aligned, it's just a matter of um, getting to work tomorrow and, and getting off to a good start. Obviously, the time is now. Uh, and we've had the same core for a couple of years, even a couple of years before I got here. Uh, so, like you said, the message is win right now. Uh, not only getting to the playoffs is, is, is that's the least. You know, you know, we we going to get to the playoffs. It's, it's, it's after that. Uh, we got to set our set our goals high and make sure you know we had a problem with losing to to worse teams last year than than us and. Uh, the professionalism is going to be a big thing for us going forward this year. Ted Leonza said that kind of there's no excuses. You guys have the talent to win. Uh, do you kind of agree with all that? Yeah, for sure. I think um, we've we've had talent in the past couple of years, but this is the most talent I think we got as a whole bunch together. And um, you now we could depend on our bench a lot more. Those guys come out and play. And uh, like I said, me and Brad just got to be leaders of the team, adding great pieces in Austin and Dwight. Uh, can help us in Jeff Green for sure. Give us some versatility on the court, and um, just gotta go out there and play basketball. Uh, in years past, when these various magazines and whatnot put out lists of the best 100 players, you've reacted to where you fell into those lists. You didn't do that this summer. Is this not on Twitter? Was that a, con con a conscious decision, or did you just not? Nah, never conscious. You never know. I might tweet something today. But um, <laughs> nah, I don't, man, it's just funny. I mean, I guess. Um, I really won't go say much about it, but if it's 31 players better than me in the league, prove it. That's all I got to say. Just prove it. Last season was a bit rough for the Washington Wizards. They finished up eighth in the conference. They did not make it past the first round of the playoffs, as well as John Wall lost a significant part of last season due to knee surgery. Um, although, uh, despite the fact that they had a limited cap space, they were able to get Austin Rivers, uh, free agent Jeff Green, as well as all-star center Dwight Howard. So a lot of good things happening with this team. A lot of positive energy in this room. Dwight Howard was one of them. He was really excited to be here. So a great day coming from 
the media uh, day here at their brand spanking new facility. So, a lot of good things happening with the Washington Wizards, especially being that Dwight Howard is now here in our nation's capital. I'm Alina Seven reporting for WBGR Primetime Sports live right here from our nation's capital. Okay. Um be a Wizards fan might be a little depressing looking at that uh, video because some of them guys, well, most of them didn't even finish the season. They didn't finish with us. Uh, as we know, uh, John Wall uh, was injured. He might not be back till halfway through 2019. Um, Otto Porter uh, was traded away. Um, Kelly Oubre was traded away. Uh, Dwight Howard was uh, Dwight Howard. And uh, yeah, I think Marquise Morris was traded away, and uh, yeah, so the only guy, <laughs> the only guy in the video who actually finished the season was uh, Bradley Beal. That's one of the uh, one of the bright spots of the season. He, uh, I think he, at some point, he might have been averaging thirty around thirty points uh, the season. But uh, yeah, it was it was a tough season uh, for the Wizards, and uh, especially for the uh, the Wizards fans, and. Uh, Hopefully, uh, some changes are going to be made to the staff, and um, you know we can get this uh, and the personnel can you know we get get better players and hopefully improve the team. Uh, looking forward to the future because uh, um, because I think with the guys we got on the team now is I think I think things are looking up. I mean I know I said the same thing last year, but uh, you know I, I've always had optimism for this team. I always be a Wizards fan, so. You know, um, hopefully we'll be in some some type of contention uh, for next year. So um, going to that, I want to go into the Go Go's. As uh, if you guys been watching, we cover we covered a uh, about uh, two or three Go Go games uh, this season. So this next video is going to be the interview with the coach. And one of the players whose name escapes uh, my memory in that right now. But um, this was after, I believe it was after the Fire Ants game, I think. But uh, we can go ahead and uh, uh, run that video for us. Okay, Coach. 121-103. How, how do you feel? It's the last game here. How does it go? I feel good. You know, obviously we, um, we didn't defend at a high enough level um, last game. You know, um, so I thought us coming out with a defensive mindset um, was going to be key. You know, we talked about them being one of the better offensive rebounding teams. Um, but I was so proud of our guys, and I think we gave up only 50 points in the first half. Um, and I knew from there we were going to be in a good position to win. Right. I think you shot, what, like 60-something percent from the field, 53 from the three. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and we what talked about – we, Thursday to now. we talked about the um, inside-out threes. You know, the, I think um, Thursday we were coming down and we were taking a lot of threes, a lot of contested shots. Um, but we just talked about the importance of us being able to get to the paint, you know, and being able to get into a window. And I think Chris Chioza did a great job with that. Um, P. Sean Howard did a great job of just getting into the paint and finding shooters on the perimeter. Um, and once you do that, the game's easy. And how about Jordan coming back? He's great. He's our leader, you know. <laughs> so um, he's a good player. He's our leader. Um, obviously, he's very talented, um, but he rebounds, you know, and so anytime you can bring another guy that can rebound the basketball, it's going to help your defense out that much. Right, but they made a run for it late in the fourth. Did you get a little nervous, though? Um, it was more so about <laughs> the standard that we set for ourselves, you know, and I thought we came down, we took some bad shots. Yeah. Um, our transition defense wasn't really great in that particular part of the game, um, so that was more of my concern. Um, I never thought we were going to lose that, but I just wanted us to close it out, you know, doing the things that we do on a consistent basis. Talk a little bit about uh, Howard and how um, important it was for It's really important. You know, he's a guy that plays with a ton of confidence. You know, so for him to get the ball um, going through the hoop a little bit, um, it's going to do wonders for him closing out this, this season. You know, he's a great player for us. He's been really good um, at various points in the season. But the thing that he does really well um, is he puts in a lot of time in the gym. You know, he's very confident because of the time he puts in, and that gives me a lot of confidence to put him in in any situation. And talk a little bit about the fans how they've been supportive throughout the season and the first season? Yeah, I said earlier, I think any anybody that comes to a G League game is passionate about basketball uh, and obviously passionate about the go-go, you know. So it was really good to see those dedicated fans come out um, every game for the most part, you know. And they, like I said, it wasn't a ton of fans, you know, but the ones that we had, they were loud, they were supportive, and they were dedicated. I think it's grown. 
I think it has too. You know, I think tonight or today was one of our, you know, more attended games um, and the crowd was was electric. So hopefully that's just, you know, something that we can continue to look forward to next season. Right. Your debut season overall, what's your, what would you give like yourself in terms of a grade, your team? <laughs> that's a tough one. Um, as a team, I would give us, you know, an A. You know, I thought we did really well. Um, our guys played the right way. Um, they stuck together through some adversity. Um, and I think this was our 31st or 30th um, different starting lineup in 48 games, you know. So there's a lot of turnover. Um, there's a lot of inconsistency. And, and our staff is trying to make things as consistent as possible. Um, with that, you know, our guys, they never wavered. Their confidence never wavered. Um, they continue to trust one another. They continue to play for one another. So um, from that, I thought it was really good. What kind of pressure does that put on you as a coach when you're <laughs> line up? I mean, one minute you have Chase and Randall, the next time you don't. One minute you have Jordan McRae, the next time you don't. I mean, what is that like as a coach? It puts a lot of um, a lot of pressure on, on our staff to make sure that the players who aren't getting um, substantial minutes are ready to go because their number could really be called at any moment, you know. So it's a huge credit to, to the staff and to the players um, for stepping up in those moments. You know, everybody talks about the next man up mentality, but nobody really understands um, what they can do to you mentally, you know, going from not playing at all to maybe being in a starting lineup the next night. Um, so I, everybody says the G League is a grind, but I think it's more so of a grind from that angle. You know, you never really know what team you're going to be facing. You know, it's not just us. It's every team in the G League. Um, right, but does that put pressure on you as a coach, though, to not really some quick decisions at the last minute i mean <laughs> um it, it forces you to be creative you okay. know it, it stretches your thinking a little bit you're you're put into some situations that you that are that are less than ideal um and you got to find the way to to motivate the team to to feel like they still have a fighting chance you got to come up right. with a good game plan um a solid game plan that can beat the opponent on any given night and how do you motivate them just showing them film of, of them doing things well of us playing the right way um giving them feedback on a daily basis has helped um, and like I said, I think our staff does a really good job of just staying in their ear, you know, talking to them even when they're not playing. You know, the last thing anybody ever wants is to feel like um, they're not valued or they're not important to a team, you know. So it's really important that the guys that aren't playing are, are still getting love, are still getting work, are still, you know, putting the time in the, with the coaches. How much lead time do you get when a player is going to be brought up? <laughs> not much. Not much. Um, okay. I would say hours? less than 24 hours. Um, okay. Sometimes less than twelve hours, so it can it can throw a wrench in the you know your game plan a lot. But again, it's same thing with our opponent. You know, you never really know who we're going to be facing. You know, um, they they go through the same issues as we do. Wow, that's exceptional! Great season so far. Thank you. Wish it's you been a really best. good one. Last I appreciate two games it. On the road, yes, plan ma'am. Of action. Um, use it as momentum. You know, we played really well defensively, um, and defense travels. You know, and just got to make sure that we, we take care of that end of the floor and continue to play as a unit. Good luck. Thank you. Ready. You ready? Okay. Jordan, great game. Welcome back. Well, thank How'd you. How would you feel? Uh, this is a little rusty. Missed the last, I think, like, like four games. So just trying to get a, a, a rhythm. But most importantly, we, we won. We, we needed this win bad, and we got it. 22 points is rusty. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I guess maybe when you're hitting like 30 for the last oh, 27 no, just, games. It's, it's not so much the points, it's just um, your your rhythm or like how you miss shots. Like ball might not come off your hand right. So it's, it's kind of it's, it's more of that than the actual like, like scoring and not scoring. On Thursday, uh, they uh, rebounded um, the last two games. They um, had really good mm-hmm. second quarters. Uh, so you didn't play in the last one Thursday, but you know, how did the uh, rebounding I just think everybody was more <laughs> locked in today. We knew we had to get this win. And uh, we just didn't let the small mistakes beat us how they've been beating us the last few games. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, uh, just taking it one game at a time. And, um, you know, as soon as... You know, we we get out there for our next game. We got we got, we got to be ready to play. So that's our thing right now. So, do you go on the road with them now? Or? I don't know. You don't know. I never know anything. Oh, okay. Any day you could be called. Yeah, any day. Any day. All right. Good job. Good job. Yeah, and as you see, that was uh, Jordan McCray. That's the player I was uh, talking about uh, for the video. Um, Jordan McCray played. Uh, 
played a few games for the Wizards. He was called up uh, a couple times this season. And some games that Elena was telling me, some sometimes in a day he would play with the Go-Go's in the afternoon and play with the Wizards at night. So uh, that's a uh, pretty good, you know, pretty good feat uh, as far as I'm concerned to, to, you know, play at that level and, uh, you know, have, have that kind of stamina. Um, but uh, the Go-Go's had a decent uh, – that decent season. I think they they just missed the playoffs. I think they were after that game. They had two games away, but uh, unfortunately they lost both of them, and they they um, they pretty much broke even the season. But they they missed the playoffs, um, just like the Wizards. But um, uh, next year we will be covering. Um, hopefully, we'll be covering more GoGo games for you. And uh, you know, if uh, you know GoGo's. Uh, you know, if you ever think about it, to, to you know, go out and see him a couple times, it's, it's kind of less of a hassle to see the Wizards, of course. But um, you know, if you want to pay the prices for uh, for that food and deal with the uh, DC traffic, then uh, you know, it's it's well worth it for you know a little family outing. Um, the, you know, it's a lot of fun. But um, of course, the next video is uh, it's gonna be the kind of like a greatest hits thing from uh, from last year. This is the uh, this will be the MLB All-Star Game uh, that me and my partner Marvin Jackson covered uh, last year for for another uh, network. And, um, you know, I've, I've com- complained about DC traffic <laughs> a lot. And, uh, you know, it was real, it was real prominent on this day. And uh, I think by every, every reporter from every media outlet in the world was – was at this the All Star Game and it was uh, it was kind of a pain to kind of kind of get around. It was like dealing with uh, you know dealing with a lot of crowds, you know, because media is not it's not a very glamorous job. Uh, about maybe ninety ninety percent of the time, it's uh, you know you're you're running to get a good shot. And uh, in my case, you know, I'm holding a holding a uh, camera for about. You know, fifteen twenty minutes, my arms are getting tired and all that. And you know, if you don't work for some of the bigger networks, then you kind of kind of get pushed off in the, into the corner sometimes. But um, we uh, we got a few interviews with uh, a few of the players, and uh, this is from uh, two thousand eighteen. Third year, you make the All-Star game. Uh, what is it that you can attribute to that you have learned over those first two years that got you to this point? Yeah, um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm very, uh, you know, I try to learn from my mistakes. And um, last year, you know, I, it wasn't what I expected. And, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, just kind of learning and having that experience of what the league is, uh, you know, trying to do to me and, you know, how guys are trying to get me out and, um, you know, not making too many big adjustments. It's just little little adjustments here and there. I think more mindset than anything. Any, any of these players that you kind of looked up to that are here at the All-Star game today? That- yeah, um, you know, I love I love Brandon Crawford. He's uh, you know obviously a great shortstop. Um, you know we play in division, so I get to see him a lot, and um, I'm looking forward to talking to him a little bit. What was it like when you got the call that you were an All Star this year? What went through it? And this is your third one. Does it ever get old, or do you still get that same feeling when you know you're an All Star? Um, it was incredible. Um, it was uh, Buddy Buddy Black called me into his office, and um, Nolan Nolan was in there too, so. Yeah, you know, that kind of gave it away. I, you know, I know no one's going to the All Star game for sure. So, and then he he told me the good news, and you know, just a lot of emotions. Um, you know, just very excited. What's it like to be an All Star? Cool. <laughs> nah, it's a good it's a good feeling. Um, you know, especially for my family to come here and they get to experience this. This never gets old, so it's a it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good feeling. What are you kind of out of the game tomorrow? What am I expecting? Yeah. Um, a lot of excitement. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of great baseball players here, and I think everybody's excited to see uh, tonight the home run derby and uh, and 
and uh, tomorrow a lot of good uh, pitchers and a lot of good hitters going at it. I saw the, the Futures game yesterday <coughs> and uh, a lot of good talent, but it's a little different. The talent is a little different, a little more uh, speed, base running, mm -hmm. uh, great defensive play. Right. Uh, do you think you're part of that group, these young guys coming in? I think uh, I think there's certain players, or there's very few players that when they get drafted that you can say they're ready for a full season in the big leagues. Um, that takes a lot of time, and, and you know, I think when you're just younger and not as experienced as a player, like I only have five five or so years in, uh, I'm still learning things every day. I'm learning a lot, and I think the older you get, you're still learning, but you know, you're 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 coming together. And I feel like you look at guys like Joey Votto, like he's he's there, and all he's trying to do is, is obviously refine or you know get better, but keep doing what he's doing and, and what he's had success doing in the past is is the challenge. How do we how do we stick with a certain way to hit when we're struggling? And that's where that mental side really comes in. And, and you just learn a lot about yourself, a lot about what other teams and pitchers are trying to do to you. And and I think if you're willing to get better and learn from your mistakes or learn from your, even your success, uh, you know that that's what gets you here. What does it feel like being back here in Washington yeah. in the All-Star game? <laughs> Coming back like a star, that's, that's really good. You know, it feels fine. It feels amazing just to be here around when, when everything started, you know. I think I, pretty, I think I know the whole facility, so I know the whole the holes and everything in here. And it feels, you know, coming back in here for the fans and everything, it feels amazing. So did you feel like when you were here and you were kind of coming up in the league, did you always feel that you would get here like this? At this point, mm -hmm. it's looking back, I don't know. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when you're young, you, you think that the all star they're going to be the same people every time. So now that I'm here, you know, I know you know, you, you just have to work hard for what you want, and I wanted to make an also game. Now I'm here. You know, I've got to keep working, see if I can make it four, five, or more straight years. If any special people while you were coming up that kind of got you to where you are, you feel like that really helped you along the way? Even just, you know, ex examples or coaches or anything? I'll say my sister, you know, she's been, she's been every, you know, like every day always there for me so you know if you need anything there's like nothing better than than, than look for your family Friends, you're asked a lot, you've been asked a lot about pressure, and you've described what you think pressure is. And I think most people assume you've been under pressure since you were 15, 14 years old. Do you think you could recognize pressure if it got to you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, one time I think going back to college, you know, I, I got absolutely dominated for two weeks uh, prior to you know, our opening season uh, in February, actually it's fall ball. Um, so I'm sitting there and I'm 17 years old and actually I'm 16 still. I just got back from Team USA and I'm about to turn 17 in October and turn 17 and got into fall ball like right after that. And uh, I got dominated for two weeks. I punched out nine times, 10 times and uh, probably a matter of 12 at bats against my own team. And I sat there and thought to myself, man, I'd like to go back to high school right now. And uh, so I sat down and, you know, I sat there and was like, you know what? I don't want to do this. And I, I sat there and was like, you know what? I, I want to go back to high school. I want to go enjoy those moments and do that. But uh, I knew that I couldn't do that. And I sat down and they said, no, you can't come back. You test it out. And so I said, okay, well, got to cowboy up and do the things I can to you know, do what I need to do. And uh, a week later, we started our fall ball season, and I went deep in my first at bat at Cashman Field, and uh, the rest was history, I guess you could say. You know, but that moment and those you know opportunities that I had when I was younger, at 17 years old, playing wood bat um, in junior college against guys that were 22, 23 years old, was one of the most you know pressurized situations I've ever been in. Because if I don't have a good year that year, then 
you know, I might never be playing baseball. I never got drafted. So well, you recall that pretty quickly. Absolutely. I mean, it was only what six years ago. Yeah. So, <laughs> I got a chance. You know, I mean, it's it's those moments that make you who you are. And uh, I'm at, you know, I'm 25 years old, and I'm able to play this wonderful game of baseball every single day. What what pressure do I have to feel? You know, what pressure do I feel running out to right field every single day? What pressure I feel is. For every other guy in my clubhouse, for every other guy on my team, or my fans in my stadium, I mean, it's it's the game that I love to play. It's something that you know, I get chills. I mean, it's there's nothing greater than going out there and putting on 34 and being Bryce Harper and loving the game that I play. Were there any uh, moments when you were growing up, all-star game moments, that you remember now? Uh, I would have to say Cal Ripken. I mean, that's, that's I mean, that's that's the one that really sits in my head of you know him hitting the homer and getting shifted from third base to shortstop. Um, I mean, it's, those are the moments you look at. I mean, if, if he's doing his violin or if he's doing this swing or that swing, I mean, the guy was a magician. And uh, I mean, it's something that I really look at and I see Cal Ripken and. Um, I think it's the only one I really like, really sit in. I remember because you see all the previews and things like that. And I was never watching the All-Star Game or Home Run Derby because I was always playing. So, um, but those are the moments that I see. Uh, I think that's the only one that really vividly, vividly sits in my. Okay, so um, that was from the All-Star Game from last year, and again, you see another uh, star athlete who is not with the Washington organization again. Uh, yeah, Bryce Harper, of course, uh, I think we talked about a couple weeks ago. He was with uh, the Philadelphia Phillies. And um, see the, the uh, uh, Nationals, uh, they're, they're, at, uh, they're at, I believe, they're at 500 uh, currently in the season. But, um, again, uh, every time I see that, that particular video, I always think about the – Again, the DC traffic, what a hassle it was to get down there. Because there was a uh, funny story going going down there. I think um, if uh, you you ever ever do anything like that, um, if you're going to baseball games, I would suggest to take take the metro because uh, driving is kind of a pain. And um, you know, I, we. It was uh it was me, Marvin, and uh we have another cameraman named Chris. We uh we drove down there, of course. I drove with my car, of course. Uh, I believe they, they didn't want <laughs> they didn't want to drive down there. So uh we drove down there. Um now of course for the media they had uh they had a hotel and they had the media parking and they also had a shuttle that went to went back and forth from the stadium to the hotel. And but uh, for some reason we opted not to do that. We drove uh, right from the station to to the game, and I drive by the parking lot, and it just said uh, parking. I think I believe it said parking for five or ten dollars or something. And the gate was open. There was no attendant, so I, of course naturally we they tell me, okay, we'll, we'll just park here, and uh. I parked my car there, and quite a few people parked their car. But uh, uh, we walk in, you know, we, we do our thing, and I'm I'm coming out, and the guy's putting tickets on everyone's car. And of course, I'm you know we're asking what we're, uh, you know, there was no tenant. Where have you been? And people were leaving notes on his uh, his window, and uh, he said, "Well, it's, it's, uh, all these spots are reserved. They're reserved over the internet. You know, they have." Uh, the sites where you can, you can reserve your uh, your parking spot where if you're going to a like a especially like down like a sporting event or a concert or whatever you want if you opt to drive then uh you know some people uh you know they give up their driveways you know for you know make a few bucks for let, let people park their car there as long as you reserve it but um you know of course uh, you know the guy comes out and I, I don't know if the guy was uh he was trying to scam us or, or what but um uh, I believe uh, Marvin kind of uh, would say he talked him out of it, <laughs> like uh, or yelled out of it, the uh, the pan, whatever. And uh, I had to move my car, and where I moved it, uh, I thought it was okay. But uh, 
you know, of course, go again, come back, and uh, there's a twenty dollar ticket on on the car. So uh, you know, I just went ahead and uh, I just went ahead and paid the ticket. I didn't, you know, I didn't want any hassle. But uh, yeah, that's uh, again, that's DC traffic. And uh, I remember every time I every time I see that video, I remember what uh, what a pain in, pain in the ass it was to get to to get all that all that footage. And um, but uh, yeah, again, it's not not always glamorous. But um, let me see the next. I'll close my list down here. But um, next video I have to show is, is again. This I think this one from I did from last year. This was uh, a video I did with a basketball camp where I met a young lady named uh, Dominique Johnson, and uh, she was one of the coaches of of that league. They were they were teaching uh, you know kids to play basketball, but um, you know so I went. Went down there and um, I asked if I could take, you know, take some, uh, take some shots and take some photos and and uh, they said I could come down. I think it was uh, Nikki Lewis was a part of this uh, part of this camp and um, so I went down there, did a little small interview and um, it's about a little two minute video that that I did from uh, WBGR. So go ahead and run that. Dominique Johnson, a former Riverdale Baptist alum, former Towson alum. Three fun facts about me is that I'm Filipino, I love rice, and I got two kids, they're actually dogs. One's Deuce and one's Kobe. Hi, I'm Coach Eric Q. Um, director of uh, basketball uh, organization for Triple Threat Basketball here at DC. Um, we're doing some camps, um, training clinics uh, here in Paint Branch High School. Uh, if you're interested to join, you can call. Uh, you can uh, follow us our Facebook page at the um, Triple Threat the DC, and we have our website www.tripletreatdc.org. Um, we're trying to improve, um, make, uh, develop some kids from 8 to 19 years old, men's and girls and boys. Um, if you want to join us, all you got to do is just go to our website. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. That was uh, Triple Threat uh, Basketball. And, uh, again, I was saying I met uh, Dominique Johnson there that um, – and one day I'm gonna try to get her on uh, this show. Um, I've interviewed her a couple times before, but um, right now she runs a a basketball camp. It's called uh, One Up that uh, she runs out of uh, out of Laurel. And I also went to went to see her at this particular camp. Uh, this is where she she teaches um, young girls. Uh, basically the, the game of basketball 
And uh, I think she has a, uh, I think it's a winter and a, like a, maybe a summer, summer and a winter class, I think. But uh, this is, uh, I think this is one of her, one of the first uh, classes she, she was running. And uh, so again, I went, went down there to the gym and I brought my camera and uh, and I was going to put together this little package. learned so much even though the kids came here to you know learn something about the game or you know wanted to get better I feel as though that there was a lot that um, you know I learned throughout the whole process um, so it's very humbling experience but I can't wait for the future events the experience that we aim to, to give is basically we want to teach leadership through basketball. We want to be able to add value any way that they can. And if they come through the one-up doors um, on the first day, but the last day, they become a better player than they were from day one. So I personally did agility, condition, and strength. Um, you know, obviously everybody can throw up a basketball, try to make a hoop, could do a crossover to do all the finesse of basketball. But what they don't realize is that it's conditioning constantly. You have to be strong playing against the sport. And footwork matters, whether it's a pivot, whether it's a sharp cut, a V cut, so forth and so on. There was a lot that that goes unmentioned when in the game of basketball. But that was one of my stations. Um, I had a shooting station um, with Coach Maggie. Um, Coach Maggie, for those who don't know, she is a Syracuse alum. Um, she played for Archbishop, Archbishop Spalding here in Maryland. Um, and she was one of the best shooters I ever competed with. Um, to have her teach that the shooting drills coming off of a tight curl, form shooting, um, all those necessities of what makes a great shooter a great shooter, um, she did that. Um, Coach Tyler, who is at Elms College currently, um, he did a lot of the dribbling. I thought that that was very important because he transitioned from a shooting guard to a point guard. Obviously to control the team and make sure you're the captain on the floor um, is important, but being a point guard, you have to dribble. Then we had Coach Taylor, who's also a Syracuse alum and a former professional basketball player. She did a lot of the post work with the girls. Every kid, whether it was a small girl, a post player, whatever size they were, they were able to experience what a post player goes through and some of the drills to make a, a great post player. Then we had Coach Tati doing the most important part of the game, which was defense. She's currently at Francis Marion um, College down in South Carolina, and she's a, she's a post player. So defense counts when you're a post player, but more importantly, all five players on the court, including the person on defense. So, um, you know, that's how basically our, our day went as far as stations. And then we did instructional blocks where you know, basketball IQ was a big emphasis when coming to one up. And we did, we put great emphasis on things like triple threat. What's implies important to be in a triple threat position. The importance of passing, the importance of what a post player goes through. So a post wing entry, a, a post to wing type of pass. Um, we did a lot of, you know, dribbling, you know, whether to dribble underneath the, the knees, certain stuff like that. Pinpointing on basketball IQ was our instructional blocks. So every day they had stations, they had competition games, and then at the end of the day, other than games, it was instructional blocks. Before the year is over, I do want to have a, um, a holiday winter break um, clinic for all my girls. Okay, and again, that was uh, the One Up Academy with uh, uh, Dominique Johnson. And uh, I said again, I'm, I'm try to get her, try to get her on the show one day. Um, she, um, as I know her background, she played at Towson University. She's the leading player of man or woman to have 
the most three pointers in a uh, career. But uh, she had a very impressive career at, at Towson, and she played a little bit in uh, overseas, I believe. But uh, uh, again, I'm I'll do my best to try to get her on the show. But uh, the next video is. I think it's my crown and jewel, I'm going to say, because I think this video inspired a lot of people. This was um, iFly. This is the skydiving at uh, Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, that's one of the locations. I believe they have another location in, uh, I think, in the White Marsh. But um, I went out and I visited them last year, and I got into, you know, the, the, got the little suit on, got, took the class and got into the tube and got into the tunnel and did uh did the simulator or the uh the skydiving simulator. So uh again this is uh this is iFly. Explain the iFly experience when somebody first walks in the door. Will they, the, like, they're the first time you're here? Will they, will they? Yeah, so the first time anybody comes in, it's really all about getting them stable and comfortable in the wind. Um, so we have them fill out the waiver, um, then we check them in, and then take them straight up to the flight deck. Um, so that's where they're going to meet their instructor. The instructor is going to be with them throughout the entire experience. Um, get them all their gear, so we have flight suits so you put on over your clothes, um, the helmet, the goggles, um, as well as earplugs and that sort of thing. Um, once everybody's geared up. Uh, we take the class into the classroom with the instructor. Um, that way we can show them a quick video. Um, you'll learn some basic hand signals to get you into that stable body position once you get in the wind um, and answer any questions that you have. And then once that's complete, uh, we'll line everybody up outside the tunnel, give everybody some high fives, get them excited, um, and then get them in the tunnel to fly. I became an instructor um, after about a year and a half of wanting to be one. I flew for the first time in January, no, December of 2016, and I just fell in love with it. And I became a CSR, which is a customer service representative. I answered the phones, um, took people's bookings, got to see their faces when they came in the door, and smiling with their hair crazy as they were exiting, which was always awesome and just asking them how was their flight and usually all smiles which was just really cool to see so when if you're pushing down um, it depends on where your arms are if your arms are closer to you and you're pushing down you're going to start actually diving towards the net and we don't want that we if we have your arms further out sometimes depending on your body size how your weight is dist uh, distributed with your body um, arms further out and kind of pushing down is um, the best position for some people whereas nice and straight like 90 degrees, 90 degrees is sometimes the perfect for some people. That's kind of how iFly got started. It was a place for skydivers to train their tricks in a controlled environment before actually doing them in the air when they have to worry about their own lives. <laughs> so, um, you know, we definitely have professional skydivers that train in our facilities um, and use them for those purposes. But, um, you know, we're kind of at this body flight revolution. So it's becoming much more of a sport. So um, we do train people on an individual basis um, and then we have several programs like our flight school and our flight academy which is geared more towards kids um, ages 4 to 16 um, and then for adults and older um, teenagers that want to actually learn how to fly and become competitive in the sport um, we have league nights as well um, which is run by our lead instructor Michael Huseman um, and it's you know five minutes of dedicated flight time no matter which training program you're doing um, as well as more one-on-one -on -one specialization with uh, one of our certified instructors. So how long do you have to be in the tunnel before you learn to do a flip? It depends on the person. We do want to perfect every stage that we do. So I, I still have a flip personally and I've been in the tunnel for a couple hours now but that's because I'm working 
but I do want to perfect every step that I do in the tunnel, just so I'm completely stable at everything. So um, some people, they get their body positions and they are able to turn and go up or down and up first and be able to go back and forward within their first 10 minutes. Um, and then other people, it might take longer. It's just different people have different learning curves. Maybe in the first 30 minutes, you'd be able to get a barrel down. Flips are a little more intricate because when you're doing a flip, um, the air is still pushing at you. So if you're doing a flip off a diving board, off a trampoline, the only thing you have to worry about is gravity. Um, in the tunnel, you have wind pushing up at you. So if you lean forward and you're trying to do a flip, um, that air is going to push you back. So it's kind of a weird just thought process with it. You just have to have a couple different stages to get there. So if you're just doing one thing, it might push you against the wall, whereas like another way of learning it will get you that flip quicker. And yeah, it's just a process, but every process to perfection is great. So we have the four fans at the top of our building that circulate the air down the sides of the building and then up into the tunnel. Um, so it goes through four turning veins in the process um, and down at the bottom, um, it's actually kind of, we have chillers um, that work kind of like, uh, you know, how you know your car works, except on a much bigger scale. That way we can condition the air before it's going into the tunnel. Um, you know, during the summer it's, you know, uh, 90 to 100 degrees outside, you're not going to be blasted in the face with 90 to 100 degree winds. Um, it is much cooler. Uh, we keep the winds at about 70 degrees and then in the winter months we can actually heat the air as well. So this area, this is the third tunnel in this area. Um, our Gaithersburg location opened May 16th, so we've been open for just about two months now. Um, we do have a location down in Loudoun um, and one in White Marsh as well. Those two have been around a little longer than we have. So um, we're not entirely new to the area, we're just expanding our presence. All right, again, that was, uh, that was I Fly out in uh, Gaithersburg. And, um, you know, when I ran this last year, uh, I kept asking people if they saw it, and they they uh, they said they they saw a glimpse of it. But it's funny; there's about five, or six people I know that actually went out to went out to offline and uh, tried experience. I was like, "Oh, did you see my piece?" They were like, "Like, nah." But uh, <laughs> I guess I guess I didn't I didn't inspire as many people as I thought I did. But uh, hopefully, uh, that was that was a fun experience. If you ever get a chance to uh, to go out and do it, I suggest suggest you uh, you go out and um, and uh, had that experience. Uh, it's uh, it's pretty cool. But uh, my time is uh, just about up here. So um, Elena will Elena Seven will be back uh, next week. Uh, she is again. She's on a plane coming back home, and I wish her uh, wish her a safe journey back to DC. And um, there's a lot of time left, but anyway, yeah, that's cool. Y'all got my time set up, but uh, uh, so uh, you know, be safe, have fun, and uh, I'll see you next week. Peace. Read a little bit more about what it felt like to go through that elimination game, and given that opportunity this year.